All right, everybody, welcome to the TF Podcast. I'm super excited to be here with Peter McCormick. You all know who he is. He doesn't need an introduction, uh, but we'll let him introduce him anyway. Uh, I had the chance to meet Peter in Portland, Oregon, of all places, when he came uh, a few months ago, and um, I'm a, I've been a big fan. I'm, I'm really excited about what he's doing with Defiance. Also, of course, love this, what Bitcoin did, but uh, really excited to talk about his trip to Venezuela and some of his trips around the world. So uh, with that, uh, let me welcome Peter. Uh, please introduce yourself, bud. Hello. Hi. Well, I'm Peter. <laughs> really that bit. Uh, good that? to see you again, man. Yeah, you too. Uh, I I'm actually reporting from your uh, hometown. I don't I know if you know. I really liked it. Oh, no problem. Sorry. There's a little bit of a lag. I apologize for talking over you. Um, well, I'm here in Bedford with you, so just wanted to to say what's up. Is is that green screen Bedford? It no, is. That's not. That's not green screen. I'm in Bedford right now. <laughs> Are you fucking? Dumb? I'm not staying in place. I'm I'm at the park. <laughs> I I didn't even I didn't even pick that out. So that's kind of funny because. Because right behind you is the magistrate magistrate courts where I had to go and negotiate my divorce with my ex-wife. Oh, amazing! <laughs> <laughs> and then oh. you've got that's uh, that's St Paul's Square where the where the church is. It's a beautiful church. I mean, I was I was doing some uh, some investigative journalism on my side uh, just to find it, pictures of Bedford. <laughs> so. that's a good picture. I mean, we we have a it makes it look beautiful there. I mean, we've got a beautiful river. We're very fortunate. People just think Bedford's a little shithole, but actually, it's a very lovely place. Oh, it's nice. Well, I'm I'm glad to be here in Bedford with you. Uh, thanks for for welcoming welcoming me into your town. <laughs> yeah, um, we've got a we've got a bit of a lag on the internet, and do you know what's kind of funny? I've noticed since last night when they when they first announced the lockdown in the UK, the phones I just couldn't get a phone call out, and I've noticed there's a real lag on the internet right now, and I'm wondering if the lockdown is just putting a lot of stress on the internet. It must be. Um, so I'm in Seattle, Washington, uh, north uh, west corner of the United States, and we just got onto lockdown last night. So um, oh, wow. but for for the most part, you know, what I've been saying is the, the there's the Crow Magnon people who have been you know going out and going to the beaches, um, and then you know us us normal folk. No, I'm just kidding. Have been you know staying in place for the most part. But what was funny here in yeah. Seattle, so I live in this uh, part of town called West Seattle, and there's like this really nice beach called Alki Beach. It's basically like our waterfront. Um, and, you know, this time of year in, um, you know, end of March, mid-March, you know, th there'll be people out and about, of course, but there was basically record numbers of people at the beach uh, just, just hanging out having a good time because of uh the stay in place order it's like i don't know why of all places you know you're you're being told to stay in place you're going to go to all these public parks and everybody had the same idea it's crazy yeah i don't know man there's some very strange times right now i keep saying this every interview i do or everyone i'm on i keep saying it's a very strange time and it is uh, we're in unprecedented times i mean i'm 40 i don't know how do you are but i'm 41 yeah 37 i've never known a time like this we had our prime minister address the nation last night and it felt very much like addressing the nation at a time of war yeah um it it felt very it was one of those moments where i, I made my son come and watch i said i think you need to come and watch this you need because this might be something in this might all blow over in a few months but i don't think it will yeah it's gonna get lot more serious but i said this might be something that you want to explain to your children this will be something in the history books right of what right happened during the coronavirus and i remember when my mum made me watch the tv when nelson mandela was released she just made me sit down and watch it she said you need to see this and my mum and dad used to do that with various things but mm. i just said you need to see this you need to remember this point this is this is where uh, our prime minister put us into lockdown where he, yeah, and he addressed the nation, and yeah, very strange times. I, I'm I'm struggling to process it all. Really, I don't know if you are. Oh, What's yeah. your lockdown? <laughs> is it like a statewide lockdown, or is it a city lockdown? It's a statewide lockdown. It just happened literally <clears throat> last night. But um, you know, in in the part of the country that I am, it's a very liberal uh, part of the country, and uh, you know, I think you'd find that the, for the majority of people, they were saying like, "Hey, let's let's lock this thing down." That you know, I've been pretty much self 
I call it self quarantining or self uh, staying in place uh, since the beginning of March, um, mainly because I don't want to get this thing. And you know, the, the argument is like, well, if you're a young, healthy person, uh, you'll be fine. It's like, fuck that. I don't. I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to feel. And and were you saying that you might have some? You might have felt some of the symptoms yourself, or did you ever find out if you yeah. if you did? It, d- it didn't. No, seem- so I never found out if I did. It didn't I seem comfortable. Sick. Yeah. Well, I, so I went out to Turkey, and but I'd already been traveling. So I'd been traveling through South America, and I and then went out to Turkey, uh, traveling via Heathrow Airport. Now Turkey had no reported cases at that point. You're fucking crazy, uh, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, I just look. What will be, will be. Um, I'm. I'm I'm v- feeling a, a real draw on journalism side of things, although I'm not a professional journalist. But right, right. But I've, I've been out to all these different places in Venezuela and been through all these airports, San Francisco. Yeah, so maybe it's Paranet, just from that and Vegas. so forth. What, what, who knows? But I got I got back to the UK after Turkey, and uh, the day afterwards, I just got that. You know, just before you get the flu, you get that kind of feeling. Yeah. It's just oh, a yeah. Bit like your body starts to go. You're like, oh, I think it's coming. And I went to bed and woke up just in sweats. And then the next day, my whole body ached. Just yeah. really ached. Like, almost like I'd been, like it's been the first time I've been to the gym in about a year. <laughs> uh, just all over. And I just felt shit. Just laid on the couch all day. Uh, another night of sweats and similar. And then I gradually got better. But it took 10 days. And, yeah. But they wouldn't test me. So I asked them to test me. They said, we can't test you because you haven't been to one of the main affected regions. And you haven't had confirmed direct contact with somebody who has which i think was a mistake i think right. government should have just got out there and just literally tested anyone, totally. everyone they could. <clears throat> totally yeah so i don't know if i had it um i was told to treat it like the a, a cold or a flu and treating it like the cold or the flu means okay well my son can go to school and i can go to the shops but but really i should have been well i did i just self-isolated yeah. i just made the decision myself so I don't know if I've had it. They've th- they're talking about these tests coming that see if you've got the antibodies to see if you have had it. So I guess I'll find out at some point. I think uh, the most likelihood is I haven't, but I might have. Right, right. Well, it's crazy too, like what you said there is like, hey, you know, they should have been testing everybody. And um, it's like this supply chain issue has been changed into like, oh, you don't need it, right? It's like, no, just because you have a supply chain issue doesn't mean we don't need masks. And just because you have a supply chain issue doesn't mean we don't need testing. We still need them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, yeah, I can understand why perhaps you need them to save them for the most vulnerable. But um, the the need is still there. Funny things. (laughs) I think the coronavirus is highlighting very well why everyone hates each other and everyone's arguing all the time. Because it's just another one of these things where everybody's got an opinion of it and they don't always agree. Mm-hmm. And I'm not, I, I did an interview with somebody yesterday and we were talking about the state response to coronavirus. And I was very, very quick to say, it's like, I don't know. I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert in pandemics. I'm not an expert. In economics. <laughs> it's like I'm not an expert in any of these things. And these are just like some opinions I hold, but I, I've noticed, especially on Twitter and especially in Bitcoin or crypto Twitter, there's a lot of people hold very strong opinions like they are experts in fucking everything. And it gets really tiring. It's because it doesn't become so much a, a discussion about, yeah, what do you think about this? Oh, I'm thinking about this. It's like, you're fucking wrong. The government should have done this. The government's fucking useless. Well, the gov- and it's just like, well, hold on a second. Do you, I don't believe these people are going into work every day to make mistakes. <laughs> like right. I'm not a huge fan of the government, but I, I don't believe they're going in to make mistakes. And, we don't know what information they're dealing with and the, the the variety of things they're trying to weigh up with regards to the economy and you know, health and hospital management. We don't know how they're making the decision. I don't think they're just all sitting there like nodding their heads against the wall going, duh, what should we do here? Um, and also there is so many different bits of conflicting advice. What I will say is all the so-called new experts in virus and virus management that none of them appear to be saying anything which the doctors are saying. Like, mm-hmm. that's my first point. I, I am very, very much interested in what the doctors are saying, the frontline medical staff working in ICUs or hospitals, what their experience is, what they're going through. I think right now that's, that's some of the most interesting information because these are people dealing directly on the front lines of this pandemic. And I'm not seeing any of them say anything but... It's almost unilaterally, the doctors are saying, 
this is crazy i've seen nothing like this yeah people are dying we're running out of equipment this is scary uh we've got staff getting sick there's young people on ventilators you should lock down as quickly as possible you should socially distance and and, and that's almost like a, a consistent universal message then you've got people who think they're experts saying well, oh, what about our civil liberties? Why don't we just let this flush through the system? <clears throat> well, you know, let's let's have some collateral damage. Let's, you know, it doesn't matter if a few people die. The economy is more important. I just feel right. like some of them sound like fucking psychopaths. Totally, totally. Well, what's crazy too is um, kind of also this universal, or I shouldn't say universal, but this this thought that <clears throat> if you are an elderly person, you've lived your life, so you know you were going to die anyway. So my grandmother is 94 years old, okay? She's in, in great health. I mean, sh this is someone who could live till she's 100 years old, no problem, right? And she, and she, very, mm -hmm. likely, she very likely will. Um, the thought of her getting coronavirus, like we're being super careful because we know that if in the unfortunate event that was to happen, they would not try to save her, right? Because of priorities and so forth, or, or if they do, it would be, you know, very low prioritized. So to say... <clears throat> you know, someone like her is like, well, she was going to die anyway. It's like, yeah, perhaps. But again, you know, this is a person that like walks every day. This is a person that does stretches every day. She cooks every day. So, um, you know, it, it's not like she was on her on, on her way out. And so I, I think that's what's very scary and unfortunate for some of these folks. Like there was, uh, I read this article yesterday, or the day before about this uh, Italian priest, um, like in his 70s. I know who you're going to tell me. Yeah. yeah and you he know, gave up his... Which is crazy, yeah. Head, right? <clears throat> no, not his ventilator. His ventilator, yeah. His his uh, uh, the the people in his in his parish or his church, um, you know, bought him a ventilator, and then he ended up giving it up to to a younger person to save the younger person. It's just like crazy. It gives me chills saying that, you know. Um, and I think that's really the unfortunate part is is when you have uh, folks that uh, didn't necessarily take it seriously, um, who can quote unquote do fine, and then now there's this choice like i don't know if you heard about this but yesterday this uh this the the deputy governor of texas said basically so, pseudo said that um grandparents would be willing to give up their life to save the economy this is the craziest shit i've ever seen i, I know like what the fuck man <laughs> listen <laughs> yeah, look when people are talking about the economy <clears throat> and I, I almost want to put the question out i i worded a tweet earlier and then i didn't send it because i was just like oh how many of those do you do virtue signaling? how many of those do you do so by, by day <laughs> almost tweets that's funny well because sometimes I, I somebody said to me that like you know as a journalist and i'm like yeah i know some people can say i'm not a journalist but whatever as a journalist what you should be doing is you should be kind of poking the bear a bit you've got to find stuff out you've got to question you've got to challenge people yeah like i'm not here to cheat cheer, cheerlead for libertarians and bitcoiners i'm here to find stuff out yeah you know, yeah ask questions well that's actually why, what i was... appreciate about sorry to, i'll just say one quick thing. that's actually one thing i appreciate about following and listening to you is that um i feel like you have very strong opinions <clears throat> but you are very rational and um that's one thing that i get that drives me crazy is when people have these strong opinions about bitcoin or whatever but it's they're not rational <laughs> in their no. assumptions and so well anyways, the question the question i wanted to ask it was just like how many how many deaths are acceptable for you to save the economy? Yeah. And then I thought, and then I, I did another tweet the other day, and I worded it in there. Like, you see, soldiers in a war, right? They always say that never leave a man behind. Like they will always try and rescue the man. And it's like five might die going to rescue one man, but they'll they'll take that risk because they're not going to leave someone behind, right? And yeah. I just think we we should try and save everyone. We mm -hmm. should. And then, then some people are saying, well, listen, you need to think forward. You know, what if the, this crashes the economy and leads to loads of depression and people commit suicide? It's like, I don't think you can map that. I yeah. don't think you can accurately map. Right. If we do, if we close the economy down, we can potentially, I think you can possibly estimate <clears throat> the potential number of lives saved. But I don't think you can map forward from that and say, but the impact on the economy will lead to this many people dying on this many people in poverty. I think that's difficult to map. What I th all I think you can do is deal what's in front of you. And I, I just think you, I don't know, I think we have a moral duty to save as many lives as possible. 
yeah. we just have a moral duty to save people's lives <clears throat> and if there's a if we all have to work together and you know and and and, and stick together to try and save the economy then so be it but I just think there are psychopaths out there like, well, fuck it. It's only 1%. They're all old. And I say, come on, man. Yeah. Do you want your grandparents mm. to die? Or I don't want my dad to die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's gnarly. So, so yes, mm. I, I don't know. I just, I think some psychopaths are revealing themselves right now and, uh, or some, some very fucking selfish people. And it, it, honestly, it's kind of making me a bit, I'm, I'm getting a bit like, oh, this is really depressing me right now. Like, not the fact the coronavirus happened. It's that some people have such... A, I don't know how do we put it. Such a little consideration for human life. Yeah, well, it's it, totally. It's 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 uh, it's easier when you're not faced in front of it, right? If it's someone on the screen or if it's someone you know in a tweet, but when it's when it's close to you, of course, it's going to be a lot different. And so it, it's 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 almost like the dehumanization of of. Um, culture, I guess, in, in a way, right? Like, because of the way mm. we interact with so many individuals on a given basis, right? Like, you know, like we met over Twitter, and then like, we have this thing, but then you compound that towards everybody else. And, you know, people think they know people that they don't even know type of thing, right? And so I don't know, mm. it's, it's, it's super, super crazy. <clears throat> yeah, God, crazy times, man. Yeah, crazy times. Well, let's, um, I'd love to kind of pry into your, your world travels. So you, you, when I, uh, when we met in Portland, like you had just kicked off the defiance, uh, podcast and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, since then, yeah, you've traveled quite a few places. We had talked about Venezuela, you, you know, my family's from there and I have family yep. that is, um, actually are, um, so I, I don't think, I think I told you this, but my great grandfather was exiled from Venezuela um, during the um, the uh, during the 50s and then my grandfather um, he would have um, military members come to their house and basically uh, like lift up the the crib beds and like look for papers or documents or things like that um, and then there was this time frame of democracy. <clears throat> and, um, and then in 99, Chavez comes into power. And now we have like this kick, this kick again. And my uncle, he's now here in the United States uh, under asylum um, because of, um, you know, basically having the government come to his hotel that he used to have in the Amazon and try to take him or steal stuff from him and so forth. So anyways, I, I, I was super impressed that you decided to go to Venezuela. I've always been super irritated by the example that um you know bitcoin saves venezuela because of um mm -hmm. there's so many broader issues so just love to touch on all your your, your trip man like yeah, what, yeah, what, man. what what drove you down there that was that, that was crazy like i said i, I probably won't go yeah. back there anytime soon <laughs> well so that's the thing because i'd like to go back and i i don't know if uh if i can i don't know if i've put myself on the radar and then if I go into the country, I won't be let in or actually I'm such insignificant small fry I could slip back in. I would love to go back, but I fear, I'm fearful of going back, but I'm really glad I went. Um, have you watched the film yet? Yeah, I, prom I, I unfortunately have not. I apologize, but I definitely will. I skimmed through okay. it, but I definitely, while you were down there and the things you were posting, I was diligently focusing on that and started even following some of the folks that you interviewed. Um, and that's okay. actually been really awesome as well. The, so the films are worth watching because there's two. There's the Colombia side and the Venezuela side. But what I did is, uh, you know, I prefer interviews in person. So what yeah. I wanted to do was I always want to travel to locations if I can where I can do a Bitcoin show and a Defiance show. And I've just felt this draw to Venezuela for a long time, even since a kid. Now, this is going to sound really weird, but even as a kid, I always thought the name Venezuela, like it's a cool name. Well, it just when you, sounds <clears throat> when you were Venezuela. A kid, when you were a kid, Venezuela was one of the most amazing places to be and visit. Like even was crazy. So it, I used to go there every single year for at least a month, you know, my whole upbringing. And then um, the last time I spent significant time out there was about 10 years ago. And even then it was still dangerous and scary, but you know, like you just basically dress down and um, you know, try to make sure that you're not um, drawing attention to yourself. But um, you know, the last time it was like four or five years ago and I'll never go back. So yeah. Well, 
it, it, I always thought it was a cool sounding place. If it was a, if if it's on the Scrabble board, you get a lot of points for Venezuela. It's got the good letters. It's got the V. Yeah, it's yeah. got the Z. Uh, you know, it's got the L. It's, you know, it's like, it, but it just sounds cool. And then, um, I've so I've always been attracted to it as a country. Always as South America. Always just curious about it. And then everything with Bitcoin happened and. Bitcoin can save Venezuela, and I got dragged into that myself. I got sucked yeah. into that. Of course, I did. I'm a Bitcoiner and naive as a podcaster and journalist very early on. Uh, so I decided I wanted to go. I just, <clears throat> I just wanted to go and see it, and see the truth, and both sides. I wanted to go. For, I was actually, actually, mainly going for defiance this time. Yeah. And um, by the way, I would have, I would have actually invited you or introduced you to folks to even stay with, but literally, my entire family has left Venezuela. Like that's how crazy it is. Wow. Like, and that, and that's like a two. <laughs> That's like within the last two or three years. So it's crazy. Yeah. Well, millions have left now, right? But yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so I went and uh, at times I felt very safe. At times I felt, felt very unsafe. But maybe again, I was naive. I never felt a huge amount of personal risk. And I also felt it was important to do it. I really did. I, I just felt I needed to go there and see it for myself and, and, and show what I'm seeing. Um, and it was a very strange experience. And... The, the the toughest thing I'm finding right now, as a, again, I say journalist loosely, but as somebody who's going out and just trying to understand the world and create content, is trying to navigate very complex <laughs> things. Because mm -hmm. we live in a very complicated world now, very complicated information. And sadly, lots of people consuming the information live in a very black and white world. They want binary answers. Right. So if you're <clears throat> if you're taking a look at the politics of Venezuela right now, most people who are loudly voicing opinion on it are from one or two camps. Uh, camp one is that Nicolas Maduro is an authoritarian, murderous dictator, or Guaido is a uh, American uh, uh, pup, puppet. He's, and he's part of a coup. Yeah. And and I and once you start diving into these subjects, they're a lot more complicated than that. Sure. So. For those people who think Nicolas Maduro is just a, you know, an awful dictator who has full control over the people and uh, he's only able to retain power because he has control of the guns and the army and people rely on him for education, food and jobs. I, th I think they're missing part of the story because it's very easy just to say that. But... I do actually believe Maduro has supporters. And the reason I believe he has supporters is because there are the Chavistas who, who still have a lot of influence in the country. And even those who criticize Hugo Chavez, who just want to say that Hugo Chavez was a socialist dictator who brought the economy to his knees, are also failing to recognize why he was able to have so much su su such success and why he was so popular in Venezuela. You know, get, just, just get away from a singular hate of socialism mm -hmm. uh, and that all socialism is evil. If you actually just look at what he did is he went and served the people. He went and said, we have a very poor country. We have a lot of wealth. It's time to spread that oil wealth and you know, raise up the living standards of the poorest in our society, which he did. Now, of course, you can sit there and attack his policies as, uh, as, as ridiculous socialist policies, because some of them were. And of course, you can look how as his policies started to break down, uh, as the price of oil dropped, that he started to break down the institutions, and he started to take control of the press. Again, yes, that's all valid. But you have to still try and if you I think if you're going to navigate these situations, you have to understand why he was still popular. Because if you're going to live in a world with democracy, you're going to live in a world with politicians. If you're going to live in a world with politicians, politicians are going to, at times, whether or not it's for their own personal gain or, or for the people, but they're going to create policies that put them in power. So, you know, I, that's a very complicated situation and, and similar with guaido it's very easy for people to say oh this is just an american coup he's just an american puppet again it's a bit more complicated than that because i've done my research and i can't find direct evidence that this is a coup mm -hmm. that's not to say there isn't a strong amount of u.s influence but i can't see it 
all I can see is a guy who is trying to bring democratic change in the country, would happily have open and free and fair elections, who has gone out to the international community for support because he cannot control the guns in the country, and um, and and went out to the State of the Union as a, as a guest of Trump. Now, I have my concerns over Guaido myself, but I think it's, it itself is a very, again, a very complicated situation, but people just want to deal in binary. So a couple of people saw my video and their tweets were, well, one guy just said, oh, are you being paid by US oil? And which, of course I'm not. This yeah. is completely independent. All I'm doing is showing what I'm seeing. I'm neither supporting Guaido nor Maduro. But if you ask me, I think the people in Venezuela right now would be better served by Guaido. I think it would be a safer country. I think the economy would be opened up. And I think people wouldn't be starving. But do I think he's the perfect answer? No. <laughs> so these situations are really, really complicated. And sadly, lots of people are dealing in binary opinions. And that becomes a very difficult thing to, to look, a very difficult thing to translate to people because there's so much nuance yeah. in, in, in these complicated political situations. Yeah, there's there's nuance and then also history that kind of gets forgotten. And so, a, you know, a lot of mm -hmm. people um, don't realize that before the Chavez regime, um, you know, though there was democratic leaders, um, they were very corrupt leaders, right? And so they were very corrupt leaders that um, also stole from, you know, from the, its own people, essentially. And, you know, in that time, you, you had these government leaders that were essentially being um, uh, corrupt in that way. And you have this new guy come to power and says, like, hey, like, I'm going to go ahead and, and give to you. Um, that becomes interesting. Unfortunately, that same person was was also corrupt in his own way, um, you know, still giving to the people. And you had, yes, you had oil at record highs and so forth. And but when you have like the government stealing, um, you know, from its own people, like, for instance, Chavez's daughter is one of the richest people. Uh, she's one of the richest, billion dollars. Right. Right. So, like, you know, that doesn't happen. Um, out of nowhere, right? And so um, it, it, you're right. It, it's and, and, and do you know what on that one? How, how do, I don't understand how that is okay with people in Venezuela. Those those Chavistas who uh, openly support Hugo Chavez's policies of of uh, trying to reduce inequality, trying to raise up the poorest, trying to trying to and, and, and pointing blame directly at the rich. And yet, yeah. there he, his daughter is worth 4.5 billion dollars i yeah. mean i just don't understand that it's gross beyond belief well that's something you know right there is kind of like the the um i think that's like the the nail right there is that um one of the biggest problems in venezuela is this resentment between um the the quote-unquote rich and poor or poor and rich um and uh the, the chavez regime and now the maduro regime has done a really good job of that the problem is is though the appearance is the uh, it's the poor with the rich is where the resentment lies it's actually really the poor with the middle class or the even below middle class um you know people that just happen to have um a home or so forth, not necessarily with the rich like you're talking about, right? You're, you're talking about someone with $4.5 billion. There's no resentment there. But to the person that has a house, that has something, um, there's definitely these issues. And, um, you know, when the gov when, when you have Maduro and says, like, say, hey, like, go ahead and, and take places that are empty, you know, those are yours, grab them. Or, or um, you know, if, if it's not being used, go for it. That's yours. I mean, that's a really, that's a legitimate thing. That, that That's one of the things that happened to my uncle um you know and um and, uh, and other family members for that matter so um yeah it's crazy it's gnarly it's you know for me um you know the main reasons i don't go back um actually doesn't have to do with the government because i'm not afraid of the government um because I don't think I'm at a statue where, where they would bother me, of course. Um, it's just the crime and insecurity, right? It, it's, it's, you know, the potential of being kidnapped or robbed or whatever. You know, it used to be, um, you know, 15 years ago, like you, you knew someone who knew someone who got kidnapped. Then you knew someone who got kidnapped. Then it was someone in your family that got kidnapped. Then it was multiple people in your family that got kidnapped. So, you know, mm. we've, had, we've had three members of our family be kidnapped at one point which is crazy like yeah. my so my uncle and two of my cousins and so it's like 
fuck that. Like, no, no, thank you. Um, and, uh, and, and usually, unfortunately, when that's happening, it's not just, um, you know, a, a quote unquote gang or, you know, someone who's a, a bad person. It's, it's also police. It's also people involved with, with, with the police overall. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm super impressed that you went down there. I, I don't, uh, I, I see why you might not want to go down there now that, uh, you're more recognizable. Um, I think that's probably, uh, a good idea, but, um, uh, either way, I'll, I'll yeah, I'll it's sad because I haven't told enough of the story. Yeah. That's the thing. I've been to East and West Caracas and seen the wild differences between those two parts of the city, but I, I want to get out of Caracas. I want to go to some of the smaller cities or the suburbs and yeah. and find out more and, and and see more. But right now, it's just not it's not something I I can do. I think it's too risky. I think I've done my part here now, and yeah, yeah I have to move on from this. I mean, I will continue to look into Venezuela and report on it, but I don't think it's I think it's too unsafe for me to go back again. Yeah. Let's dive in real quick uh, before I want because I want to hear about the other places you visited just on the whole yep. Bitcoin thing. Right. So what did you hear about um, with Bitcoin when you were there firsthand from folks and, and the usage of it? Um, I have my opinions that my listeners know I'm I'm um, I hold on. So I'd love to hear what you've heard and uh, and so forth. So there are there are the things I was told and then there's common sense. I'll start with the common sense. The common sense thing is that if you're on $5 a day, Bitcoin isn't for you. Right. It just isn't. And anyone who thinks it is, is living in Kyle Cuckoo land because people here, they, there's no culture of saving in Venezuela, right? Especially if you're living on $5 a, sorry, not a day, even a month. Right. A, a mu yeah. So $5 a, a month. A month. Yeah. You, you yeah. don't, you don't, you, firstly, you're not going to save. Secondly, you do not need a volatile asset. Thirdly, the uh, transaction fees are, are highly relevant. So it is not, for the vast majority of the people in the country because they're too poor and secondly yeah. it is it is useful if you're middle class of course it's useful because you can with 10 percent weekly inflation you can hold bitcoin and then just buy your bolivars as and when you need them or your dollars exactly. that is definitely a use case and people are definitely doing it but it is a minuscule number if you look at the gdp of the country and then local bitcoins it's a small number um so yeah, that, that was my experience of that. I think all the other stuff like Dash is mainly bullshit. I think it's very small communities pushing it and inflating what they're, they're doing. Uh, uh. There are certain other use cases as well for remittance. Certainly people trying to uh, move money back into the country if there's no banking. But again, I think this is very limited. Uh, another issue I found is when I was in Kukata, I was like people don't have phones or if they have a phone, they're sharing a phone or if they're, they might not have data or... I just think we're living in this this um, kind of delusional world where we think suddenly Bitcoin can fix the lives of all these very poor people. There is a right. use case for some people there, as there is everywhere else, but it's not going to fix Venezuela. Also, it's it's not going to... It, it'd be very useful for the country in a post-Maduro world, but what Venezuela re needs right now is free, open, fair elections, which are monitored by a trusted non-american uh independent party thousand percent free um, yeah to bring free and fair and open elections into the country uh i think freedom of the press a free and open press within the country would be very important and uh, and then just a chance for the country to rehabilitate itself because not only has the market got to recover uh in terms of the economy but there are certain parts of the country where so, for example, in the gold mines are run by the paramilitaries right now, and people right. are being treated as slaves and tortured. And so I think there's some rehabilitation there in terms of re removing the crime and the paramilitaries. I also think there's a lot of people who would probably want to repatriate back to Venezuela. I think it's a oh, long, long journey back to health, but it starts with open, free, and fair elections. And I, the problem is... is one, I'm not experienced enough to even suggest how that happens. I just don't know how it happens. Yeah. But I think it, it's made me more of a fan of democracy than I was previously. I was kind of, I was having my issues with democracy because in most countries, it's really kind of like a an A or B choice. You, you pick yeah. the left-wing party or the right-wing party. And then there's some countries that got central center parties. And then there's other countries that got far right, far left. But generally speaking, most countries, there's 
well, certainly in the UK and the US, is two primary parties. Yeah. And I was just thinking, well, this isn't really anything because what do you get? You just get a choice of two. You don't really like them sometimes. And But actually, it's way better than... <laughs> it's way, it was a much better situation than being under some kind of fake democracy with authoritarian rule. Um, totally. So I just think the country, the first thing the country needs is democracy and uh, independently monitored elections, perhaps by, I don't know who would be a trusted country, perhaps, I don't know, an African country of some kind. S- Switzerland. Switzerland's always yes. neutral. <laughs> yeah, Switzerland or Austria, but just, yeah. uh, and no, no coercion, no threats to those voting. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I think I think that really comes with a negotiated removal and exile of Maduro. Uh, he, he's not going to give up power. Uh, he's obviously enjoying his rule over the country. So I think sure. he, it requires a negotiated uh, exile for him with probably billions in the bank. Uh, but once he's gone, um, yeah, open and fair elections, and then and then also, but some consideration towards why Chavez was so successful. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't live in this world, which is, I'm not a socialist, but I, I do believe in a social safety net. I think a civilized society looks after the poorest. And also, if you don't, you're just naturally going to have, when there is higher quality, you're going to have crime and, and, and protests and social unrest. So I just think somehow the country needs to bring it back to some semblance of normality, but I don't know how it happens. And yeah, yeah it's tough. Yeah, no, it is tough. I mean, especially, you know, when you have like Guaido, for example, a couple of months ago, he was trying to get into the National Assembly and, you know, he's yeah. not even allowed into the building, right? And like physically forced out of the building. Um, it's, it's, it's crazy. I, I agree. I think um, some sort of fair and democratic elections are, uh, are definitely needed and, and definitely what the people want. Um, unfortunately, it's never happened. And um, the, the existing regime runs the current electoral process through their CNE. I don't know if you saw this, um, but did you see that the um, that uh, one of the warehouses that uh, was basically got caught on fire of the CNE? Um, and so, you know, there's, all, of course, all different conspiracies as to why it caught fire. But, you know, some are saying it's because of voting records and to try to destroy voting records. But I mean, it was it was a massive fire uh, in this thing. This happened um, a week or so, like like around March 15th or 12th or something like that. So no, I didn't see that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll send you the link here when we're, we're done um, on that. But uh, we'll t- t- take me all, else through through us uh, other parts of the world. So you went to Turkey. Yeah. Uh, that was crazy. yeah. Well, before that, I went I went to Santiago actually as well in Chile just oh, that's to right. see the protests there. And it, look, there are many parallels between the two countries and what's happening. The social un- unrest in Chile is um, is based around a couple of things. So, and a couple of separate things. Firstly, there's a pension reform. So they had a pension reform in the country. They went moved from a state pension to a private pension. But the problem is, is there were people who were 55 years old approaching retirement and didn't have enough time to save up for their pension. And therefore, they're living on a very small amount of money. So there was that issue. And then the kind of match that was thrown on the Tinder was the rate, raising of the prices of the underground, of the... Um, of the metro, which was like tiny, it was like ten cents or something, but it it was did it, the spark. That... Right? Did they like light a, a pl- um Didn't a, a station get lit on fire? And so, I mean, it was it was pretty heavy, right? Uh something was lit on fire before I went. I think that might have been like a electricity. I might be getting my countries confused too. So sorry about that. No, no, no. There was definitely a hu- no. There was a huge fire in Chile. I just can't remember right now what it was, but you, you'd be able to Google it. Yeah. So, but what it was really about is there again is this problem of corruption and inequality. Yeah. And the two of them, when, when the two of them go side by side, you tend to see social unrest and 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 the the underclass rising up. Someone pointed out to me a, a, a sign they saw in because uh, it's not really this isn't really about. And they saw the sign that said, "We're not left. We're not right. We're we're below." And you've got this underclass of people in Chile who just feel that, look, we're going to work, we're paying our taxes, so we're within your system, we're paying our taxes, yet we've got no education, we've got no healthcare, we can't afford them, 
And yet you, our politicians, are so corrupt that you're stealing the money and this isn't right. So the, the raising of the metro prices was really the kind of trigger for the protests. And uh, the, you know, the people were like, oh, we've, we've fucking had enough. So daily protests that um, are kind of small and it's just cat and mouse stuff between the police and, and, and the protesters. But yeah. they do, on a Friday night, they tend to go a bit kind of crazy and wild. And the sad thing is, is a lot of people have been killed. A lot of people have been maimed, imprisoned. Yeah. Uh, and I saw no attempt by the politicians to quell the violence. But I, I can... I can empathize with certain part of the protest. Now, there's part, parts of the protest I, I don't empathize with. The attacking of small local businesses, you're attacking yeah. your fellow countrymen. Right. Like, right. Do, you think those do, are, you, do you think those are the people protesting or are those just anarchists? I, th I think it's a bit of both. Yeah. I think it's a bit of both. I, th I certainly think there are people who just enjoy the protests. But... Yeah. I also, there are people who are certainly also very upset with the current political climate there. And again, yeah. it's not hugely a left free right thing. I mean, there there are aspects to it because, uh, but but it's but it's not really that. It, it, yeah. But when they're attacking the small local businesses, they're sure. harming their fellow man. Yeah. And I think that's wrong. I think you can, you can you know close the streets down, you can block the streets, you can you can throw rocks at the police. Um, but when you start destroying someone else's business that's that's your that's your fellow countryman and mm -hmm. that bit i don't agree with and that bit i do struggle with but yeah i mean i struggle to see a way out of this uh, i i really do i i don't know the answer for chile I, I need to go back i need to look into what's what's actually happening there again now but i guess it's just going to be this cat and mouse game going to go on for some time but it's all of this it just comes back to is there's so many corrupt politicians yeah they I, I, I they get away with it less in somewhere like the uk we have too many checks and balances in place it's very hard to be corrupt you can be a poor politician or a liar but you struggle to be massively corrupt i think the us i think they there's a little more corruption because of the the way lobbying works yeah um We've, you know, we've also just seen that all these senators who were selling their shares recently with relating to the coronavirus news. But, totally. but I think I feel like in South American countries, there's, there's a lot more corruption. Uh, and it's really sad because th these people are just destroying the lives of others. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, totally. It's totally. And I, I heard someone say this a long time ago. It's kind of like, you know, it's to the benefit of the, you know, quote unquote, first world or Western world or the, you know, um, Europe and, and United States to have South America in that state, right? Like, why, why, why have them in a higher state or even support a higher state? Um, if, uh, if it allows for more um, business controls and things like that, which, it, which is kind of sounds like a fucked up way to think. Um, mm. and, and I think it is a fucked up way to think personally, but it makes sense, right? Like, um, cause there, there have been opportunities either to intervene, uh, economically or politically in favor of, um, stabilization. And it seems like that's, that's often uh, not done in those areas. So, um, I don't know if they should or shouldn't per se. I don't want to have that part of the conversation, but, um, I, I, no, feel like I don't know enough about it. There's been a willful ignorance as well, I think, um, for the most part. It's my opinion, at least. Well, do you know what it is? I, I, I romanticize a lot about the forefathers who wrote the U.S. Constitution. I think there's so much good embedded in the U.S. Constitution, so much good in the, in, in the checks and balances in place for avoiding you know, poor leadership and, and poor governance. And I think the U.S. Constitution has been under attack for a long time, but I, I romanticize about their intentions and why they wrote the Constitution as it is. And it's, it feels like a group of people are like, how do we build a great state? Yeah. And I look around the world and I think, what a fucking terrible place we are now in terms of leadership. We are half the planet is ruled by dictators. We have people like Eridan who's taken over Turkey now turn that into an authoritarian regime um we have 
war still breaking out everywhere. We have corruption with the politicians. It's like, where the fuck is the good leadership? Yeah. Where are the good people coming in and saying, I just want to, I want to build a better world for the people I govern. And it's just like, I can't find anyone. I can't. So this is going to sound silly, but um, it almost feels at times like super villains in, I don't know, a Bond movie, right? And this is what I mean by this is that like these, these leaders get to a point where they have so much money for that they could not spend in lifetimes and generations and generations, right? And so like at that point, then what more do you want? It's like power. And it's like, Power. it really is, right? Because it's like, there's no much, there, there's, if we go to Venezuela, because that's what I'm familiar with, is like, the the Maduro regime has so much money that there's, there's, they could not spend that, the money that they have over, you know, probably hundreds of, uh, hundreds of, of lifetimes type of thing, right? Um, assuming compound interest or any of that kind of stuff, right? So at that point, it's power. And then like you're saying in Turkey, same thing, it's like this, this power um, need. And, you know, I think we've seen that here in, in the US with Trump, um, the attempt at like this feeling of power. And, you know, what I've long said is, without getting super political, but people obviously can tell where my uh, affiliations lie is that um, I, I believe Trump has taken playbooks from what has worked in authoritative regimes. Um, and not necessarily because he wants to be authoritarian, I don't wanna say that part, but the way he behaves and acts and believes things should happen, is just so similar like this attack on 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 journalism um the 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 way he insults the way he positions the business dealings i mean like you just look at what chavez did and it's it's so similar it's it's crazy it's really interesting to me yeah trump's a funny one there's sometimes i think what you did there was brilliant because it was it's different like he Mm -hmm. is different yeah and then other times i'm like what are you doing What, what listen to yourself but my biggest issue with Trump is that I think he's created too much divisiveness. Yeah. And he's, he's kind of normalized really shitty behavior towards people, mm-hmm. really insulting behavior towards people. Like it's okay just to shit on your fellow man and just insult them. And this kind of, this new label of snowflake that gets thrown at anyone who yeah. remotely tries to show some compassion towards other people. Uh, and that I don't think is good. I mean, uh, and that's exactly what because... happened. Sorry. I was going to say, that's exactly what happened with Chavez in Venezuela. Uh, at the beginning. Right. Okay. And, yeah. uh, and the thing is, it's not like I'm a huge Obama fan. I'm certainly not a Hillary, Hillary fan. I, I think, um, I think Bernie Sanders, has some great principles but i i I think i don't think economically his policies are sound and it's not like i'm one side or the other i'm actually uh, i would rather judge everyone independently on on their good and bad side totally agree and and and, you know what and i think i think trump hasn't been given enough credit from the left for the things he's been good at and i don't think he's been criticized enough from the right for the things he's got wrong it's yeah. just this left right divide so if you're a republican whatever he does you'll make an excuse for it. and if you're a democrat you'll criticize and i i think i don't think that's right i yeah. and i also think he's just not a particularly great leader at times right when he came out a few days ago and calling coronavirus the Ch- the china virus yeah because it's from china i just thought <laughs> that to me was really really poor leadership yeah and that's I, not me sitting, I you know, agree. I put it on Twitter and people are like, oh, you just got Trump derangement syndrome. I was like, no, I've defended Trump. I've yeah. said things about how I like. And this is the thing. I can be objective because I can tell you what I like about him and what I don't. You can't. You're yeah. losing your shit because you're a, a Republican and you'll defend everything he does. You'll, 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 you won't be objective about it. And, and trust me, trying to defend Trump in the UK is fucking hard work, man. I like trying to let any of my family, like my brother and my dad, I've defended things to him. And I've said he's far better than Hillary Clinton. And they lost their shit with me. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think we need to be critical. Yeah, I agree that, um, you know, the political divide people definitely jump on or they, they, um, they get to, uh, you know, obsess on a particular narrative. Like, so Trump the other day, for example, said something about, um, you know, you can clean or disinfect the mask and everybody jumped on him for that, right? Like, oh, you, you're, you're an idiot basically for saying that. And it's like, fuck man, like 
I, I, I'm not, I'm not a medical professional. I don't want to say that someone can clean their mask because I don't know, but, um, you know, if, if there are no masks at all, and if, if, if there's somehow some way, a way that you can, I don't know, heat this thing up, do whatever in just anything. I just don't think it was something to just like completely hammer them over. Now there's other things like, of course, like, yeah. these, you know what I mean? So that's, so what, so what happens is people shout so much that then you don't know what to listen to or what to care about. And so well, it's I like, could throw one in on that. Yeah. So he did, he, I, I, I don't, I forget the details, but people can find the details, but he mentioned one of the drugs a potential for something like the malaria drug oh yeah 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 um so, i know what you're talking about the hydro something um yeah, yeah sorry go so ahead so some guy went and bought so some guy went and bought some or something like uh, and then swallowed it and died right? right and a bunch of people are like well this is trump's fault he's got blood on his hands because he's no the guy is a fucking idiot consuming something he knows nothing about he should have spoke to a, a doctor and or, or somebody who understands it and said, look, should I be taking this? He's a fucking moron. For taking it. And yet people want to go, ah, Trump's got blood in his hands. And I, again, I disagree with that. I just, I think people really need to try and be a bit more objective. Uh, I think, I don't know, we've lost objectivity. We're, we're at that place where everyone just fucking hates each other and just wants to shout each other. And it's just yeah. like, come on, man. Totally. Like, aren't we meant to work together? Aren't, aren't, we, aren't we meant to support our fellow man? So I think Trump had this really interesting opportunity that he blew to essentially own coronavirus and basically win with his platform. And, and let me kind of relay this to you and see what you think. So, so, you know, Trump is very much America first, right? And he wants to yep. manufacture everything locally. And he, you know, doesn't like, he's trying to be, um, you know, very uh, self distancing from from China from an economic standpoint, and he wants borders. You know, he doesn't want uh, he wants a Mexico border, and you know, there's all these different things. If he would have just owned coronavirus as this threat, he could have pulled off his entire agenda. Like he could have said, like, "Wow, coronavirus is a thing, and it's because of foreign foreign whatever." So we're going to go ahead and we're going to build our wall, or we are going to manufacture only locally from now on because of all. The he could have he could have won, and and I'm just so surprised that no one in his group basically said like, "Yo, man, let's go ahead and just own this coronavirus as being an actual big deal, and um, let's just play it to our narrative." Uh, I, I think they did a really, uh, you know, uh, uh, they, the the playbook that they ran wasn't very good for, again, being an objective person, being not not saying that that's what I would do myself or what I want to, but for, for basically them winning, I, I'm surprised they didn't do that. Well, I think what happened here is that um, I think the 2020 election was a slam dunk for him. Like, yeah. It doesn't matter whether it was Bernie or Joe Biden. I think it was a slam dunk. And... <laughs> He's lived off the economy for quite some time because the U.S. economy has been flying. Obviously, people would analyze it and say, well, because of the money printed, well, this, that, the other. it doesn't matter. He's created jobs and the economy was thriving. And any solution to controlling coronavirus, you either, you've got two options. You either uh, protect the economy but the cost of the trade-off is people's lives and the health service being under under attack and people unable to go to the hospital because they haven't got health insurance, all those kind of complications. Or you lock the economy down and you lock people down and that locks and that fucks the economy. And I think that and my assumption as a as a not really a political analyst, but my assumption is that was what he was fearing. And that's why he was a bit dismissive but let's be honest a lot of people have been dismissive sure right i think yeah. we've all thought i don't think when it first came out in china we we all thought three months later we're going to be in lockdown in our own countries really in some ways unable to leave our homes certainly right. under the threat i mean i just went for a run <laughs> I, I i'm overweight and i just went for a run because it, uh, not because i run regularly because i wanted to get out <laughs> and there was a police car circling bedford park where i am now you don't get police cars in uh bedford park uh, you might get them at night perhaps because of dr druggies but you don't get a police car in the day circling the park ever but it's circling the park to check if people aren't grouping together i know why it's there yeah and i none of us saw that coming you just we just totally. did i mean maybe maybe some people did and i just don't think they realized what they were dealing with i don't think anyone did because if you realize what you were dealing with you would start the lockdown way earlier 
right because you would limit the problem earlier yeah so i just i feel yeah sometimes we look at these people like oh you're the 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 president of america you should get this right he's still just a human like you or i yeah yeah we've all got our opinions on it well he has an opinion Although, yeah, I guess the only counter that I say is like, you know, we'd like to think that he has access or or his group has access to information that that we don't to help make some of these decisions. But, but perhaps uh, they've got access to information which says that if you lock down today, you're going to have social unrest because there is very little um, infections here. Uh, the best way to control this is to do it slowly. So first yeah. we have more. No, secondly I, advise you do, do you know what i mean we don't none of us know that well, we're not in the room for sure and i actually i i think you have a super valid point there is especially in a country like the u.s or the uk um that's not accustomed to having someone or uh the government tell them what to do from the civil liberties standpoint uh yeah i, I think you're very likely correct actually in that in that regard um because yeah it's you know you tell you tell an american like stay home and there's nothing going on it's fuck you like i'm not doing that guns america no i'm just kidding but (laughs) but, but, uh you know i'm I'm getting a bb gun to protect myself so we'll we'll see what that does (laughs) but hey it's uh, it's so complicated dude it that's crazy um we we I, I wanted to go back real quick though to Turkey because we, yes. we we went back to America from there. But so you went to Turkey, you went to the front lines. Uh-huh. You're seeing um, the migrants come, and and you know you're, you're seeing basically different fights break out. And you know, tell us about that. That that seemed pretty crazy. Yeah, no, I didn't see the fights break out. So oh, I here. got so I heard about the trouble on the border, and I'm like, look, this is three hours away. I'm going. I've I've got um I'm feeling a real attraction towards the journalism side, the the, the reporting side. I I don't know why, I just I just am. And uh, so I heard about it, and I thought I just want to go and see it for myself, see what I can see. Uh, the mainstream press were telling part of the story, but. I, I some the problem I have with mainstream press is a two minute soundbite, and some of these comp, these topics are quite complicated. So I want to go there and produce as much content as needed to tell the story how I want to tell it. Yeah. So yeah, so I went out there, uh, went up to the board. Now they the, the problem you've got in um, the problem you've got in Turkey is you don't have a free press there either. Um, Eridan is completely changed that country over the last few years uh so there's certain risks but we got up to the border and they weren't letting any of the press in so i just put my iphone in my pocket and started walking with this somalian guy because they were letting the refugees in the migrants in so i i went with him up to the border and just kind of wandered around with my hood up and interviewed a few people yeah and 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 what i found was is my interpretation of the situation is that everyone is right. <laughs> mm. And what I'm, I've told this before, what I mean by this is that Turkey has taken in 3.7 million migrants. And that's a combination of refugees from Syria, refugees from Iraq, to ep- economic migrants from Africa. I mean, some, some people are refugees, some people are migrants, some people are economic migrants, but they've taken in 3.7 million people, at least. Yeah. They've said, this is too much. We, we cannot support this economically or socially. Uh, Greece is had too many refugees and migrants. I mean, I think it's about a million they've taken of, for a population of 10 million, which has a lot of so- social integration and economic, causes economic problems as well. And they're right, they have. And you know, Europe has taken a lot of people and those people in Germany or Sweden who complain about social integration, they're also right. Everybody's yeah. right. But yeah. at the same time, you've got a group of people here who are f- fleeing war zones, f- fleeing authoritarian regimes, fleeing collapsed economies who want to make a better life for themselves. Now, when you make a statement like this, you're going to have, you're missing the nuance because some people are going to say, oh, they're just economic migrants. They should, they should stay in their country and make their country better. And it's just like, well, hold on a second. The only difference between you and them is, is the mother they came out of. Yeah. You came out of a mother in, in the States or, or in France or in the UK, and they came out of one in Burundi or in Iran. Yeah. 
Uh, and also, add into that, some are fleeing a war zones. Fucking sorry, but if I was in Idlib, I would flee with my family. Totally. Uh, and some are fleeing Iraq. I mean, who, you know, we're, we're responsible for the state of Iraq. Certainly partly responsible as, as a nation. The UK and the US are partly responsible for what's happened there. So, so, so I struggle with that. And I, I struggle with wanting to hold back anybody who wants to go and make a better life for themselves. And then they'll say, well, you're just letting terrorists in. And yes, undoubtedly, there has been an expansion of terrorism in Europe, perhaps in the US, but in Europe over this, uh, ever since the Afghanistan and Iraq wars. But again, is that is that a result of the wars, or mm -hmm. is you know no? And also, when you've got millions of migrants and a handful of terrorists, do we condemn the millions because of the handful? So I think you have to look into the nuance of, of it all, and, and you also have to just say to yourself, well, what would I do? Yeah. And I'm not saying open up the borders. I'm just saying let's let's understand why people are doing this and let's be a little bit more compassionate because as I walked out, there were two things that stood out. There was, there was a late, I think she was pregnant. She was from Sierra Leone. She was there with her husband. She was just lying on the floor crying and it was devastating. And then there was another lady who was changing her baby essentially in the mud. I mean, it was like this muddy field. Mm -hmm. There was a queue that went on forever for everyone to get their daily meal. I think they got one meal provided daily. Wow. Uh, like this, they're living a shit life, and then yeah. some of them are spending all, all the money they have to get on a boat that might sink and they might drown, right? Just to try and get to another country. Like, like these people are fucking desperate. Why are they doing this? And what what is so great about you? What would you do differently? You're saying you would stay in Iraq where there are countless bombs going off. There is, you know, a, a very very tough economy. You saying you would stay there? Well, you're saying, do you know what? Fuck this. I'm going to try and go to Europe and, and build a business there and, and raise my family there. So I don't know. I just, and it, do you know what was really funny? It was this one guy, this Greek guy, was having a go at me on Twitter. And I looked at his profile and he was living in the US. And I was like, well, hold on a second. You're an <laughs> economic migrant. You're in the US. He's like, well, it's different. Oh, fuck off, mate. Yeah. And so, so yeah. So I, I think in all these co very, very complicated situations, there, there is, I think sometimes it's really important to go and see what the human story is here. And I'm not saying I can solve it or anyone can, but right. at the same time, there is these stories of human suffering. And that's, I guess through everything I've been doing, this is the patterns that I'm seeing is, you know, I go to Venezuela and whether you're a Guaido or Maduro or impartial, there are people who are, living out of the rub, the food the scraps they can find in the trash yeah or they are they are sleeping on the streets in kukata trying to get to the front of the queue to get fed and they're there with their baby and whatever you think about what's happening in with migrants in europe there are people who are drowning trying to trying to cross the mediterranean just to get a better life for themselves or with coronavirus when you'll sit there saying well what about the economy there are doctors and nurses going to work every day risking their lives who might end up with coronavirus and a ventilator who might die i mean uh, and i just think i don't know maybe maybe i am a fucking snowflake but <laughs> I, I can't help but be drawn into the the human side of some of this and and that's not to say solving these issues is not hugely complicated or they can be right it's just but i just i'm really drawn into just trying to show the human side of things that's going on I mean, I, I think that's a great outlook. And, you know, regardless of what like the the political or action of it is, I, I think the moral here is everybody can have a little bit more compassion, right? And, you know, you, you can't blame someone, anyone for that matter, for um, desiring a better life for themselves or their family. And, you yeah. know, like you said, we, we would all do the same thing in that position. And, you know, for, for me, um, you know, like I'm the only person in my entire family that was born in the United States. Everybody else was born in Venezuela. They've all made it out of Venezuela, but my life would be totally different. Right. And so, like you said, is that mm. I always think of it as like, I won the lot first things first, I won the lottery to be born in the U S and so, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I uh, I'm very thankful for that. And, you know, I, I have a tough time when, when there's a lack of compassion for, for the people who are, 
um, migrating. Like I said, I don't know what the answer is either to, to your point. You know, I, I don't know how you handle that influx. I can imagine, yeah, if you're in Greece and, you know, um, 1%, you're, you basically get a 10% population increase um, from migrants. I can understand like that would be, you know, socially disruptive, but um, yeah. Crazy, crazy it stuff. is a lottery you're right it's a lottery i mean I, I won the lottery being born in the uk to two great hard-working parents who never divorced and gave me a great upbringing it's a, but my father is an economic well he's the child of an economic migrant his dad was irish and moved to the uk to get work to mm -hmm. work on the trains um and i think i mean it's very rare to find somebody who's got a pure bloodline from their own nation anyway Right. Um, I don't know, dude. I just think there are a lot of assholes out there yeah. with very little compassion who who just I don't know, just I don't know, dude. I, I don't know how to explain it, <laughs> but I'm I'm, I'm no, continually I... I'm continually disappointed by the attitudes of people, the selfishness and the lack of compassion they have for other people. I also think there is just a lot of inbuilt racism. I, I think people that they won't admit it, but I, I imagine when they see footage of Africans and Middle Eastern people queuing up at the border of uh, uh, Greece, they don't consider them as a fellow man. I think they see them as subhuman mm -hmm. and they just don't give a shit. But and I think that's, I think, I think there is, I'm not saying everyone is, but I certainly sure. think some people are just fucking racist. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, they've been saying that there's some good things hopefully coming as a result of, of COVID. Like hopefully people start getting a little bit more compassion when they start thinking about like, you know, how this could hit for them. And, and you know, yeah. you have places in the U.S. where people are, are hoarding things, which then means that people, you know, have lack of access to certain things as well. And um, yeah, per perhaps maybe that might be some of the good that comes out of uh, of this overall. Well, yeah, we're gonna. I think we're gonna go to one or two ways. We will come out this with uh, stricter governments, more surveillance, more authoritarian rule, less freedom, less civil liberties, or we'll come out of this and it's just like a chance to reflect and just say, you know, have we got this right? How could we be doing things better? And and I do think Bitcoin's important. Yeah, I do think the money flow is important, I, but. I don't think it's the I, I don't think it's the only solution as some people seem to think it is. Uh, I, I I don't know. Yeah, I'm probably being a bit of a misery guts right now, am I? <laughs> no, no, this has been <laughs> no man. This is good. This is good. I, it's it's fun to interview you because you know you're all you're always the one doing the questions. So um, it's it's good. I to always think I'm a poor guest. <laughs> no, you're a great guest. You're doing good. Um, <laughs> Well, cool, man. Well, this has been an awesome conversation. Is there anything you'd like to leave our listeners with or a question you want people to start thinking about um, as they go about their day, um, as they walk through Bedford with me? I'd just like people to just watch the videos I'm making. Uh, I, I want to be a filmmaker. And the only way to do that is, is by having people wanting to watch them. I'd love them oh. to check out the two films I've made so far. I've got the one coming out about Turkey soon. Uh, give me their feedback. I'm, I'm really not proud. If you don't like something or you think I can do something better, let me know. Just just support that work because uh, if, if I can get enough eyeballs on it, I can keep making them. So yeah, any support to the Defiance TV stuff, that would be fantastic. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we'll put that, make sure to put that in the show notes as well. Thanks buddy. Um, Peter, again, thank you so much for taking the time. Hopefully when everything blows over, you come stateside, we can see each other in person. <laughs> I'd love to see you again, man. I had a really good time. I wish I'd have had more time in Portland, but I really need to come to Seattle. You know, yeah. I need to come to Seattle. Seattle would be Talked amazing. about this for a while. Oh, that'd be amazing. Well, when I will when... make my first place to go to when I come over again. That's excellent. I love that. I love that, man. Cool. Well, hey, uh, stay safe over there. Um, we'll hopefully, maybe we'll even catch up here in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. But um, yeah, hope all is well. And yeah, everybody, make sure that you're listening to Peter's two podcasts, which is what Bitcoin did, as well as Defiance. Uh, you you won't regret those those decisions. Uh, cool, man. All right, we'll talk soon. Stay safe. <laughs>